I'd like to begin by simply thanking Sweden for everything Sweden has done for my country. For taking in so many of uh, my countrymen when we were occupied, including my mother and father 67 years ago. Uh, but I, most of all, would like to uh, say that I'm uh, in Sweden to, on the 20th anniversary of the restoration of independence. Because Sweden has done so much for us, and because I think we can do much more, uh, and perhaps in a new role, and that's what my talk today will be about, is a, a new way of looking at Europe. Uh, tentatively, it's where the talk would be called Old and New Europe in 2011. Uh, it's, the title is purposefully ambiguous because the dichotomy of new Europe versus old Europe has served as an all-purpose vehicle for any number of discussions for the past 20 years. Only in the past decade, it has meant so many things that to unravel what it means requires one to keep a tally of who is speaking, who is in power, whether it is a historical description of the post-Cold War settlement and security policy formation or in a complete category shift, a description of what we mean by fiscal responsibility in Europe today. And these meetings are not often overlap. But I will go briefly, begin by briefly looking at what old in Europe has meant for the past 20 years and then perhaps suggest a new way of looking at it. Back with the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the Yugoslav Federation, and the Soviet Union, New Europe came to stand for the swath of countries from Estonia in the north to Slovenia in the south that emerged from the communist dictatorship and throughout the 1990s embarked on massive reforms and sought European Union and NATO membership. New meant overtly or implicitly, among other things, horror, more corrupt, often criminal, less well-governed, governed, probably less democratic, in need of often patronizing tutorials on ethnic and other forms of tolerance compared to the established, rich, honest, safe, well-governed, democratic, and tolerant old Europe. Old didn't know quite what to do with the new. On the one hand, there was the understanding that those who through no fault of their own suffered communist domination should be brought into the European fold, as indeed Germany did with the EDR. On the other hand, it was all a bit hard to take. The news, as it were, were neither common fall nor salon fait, if you know what I mean. Bringing them into the EU and NATO, the European structures that had served Western Europe for, de for four decades meant there would be a overall decrease in wealth, cap funds would decrease, while the anti-communist position of so many of these new countries struck old Europeans as primitive, redolent of Cold War American attitudes, and besides, the real money was to be made in Russia. East Europeans in general, with their dubious attitudes towards ineffectual and costly social welfare networks, of which they had ample evidence, and their unsavory appreciation of the United States struck many as a mixed blessing. All the New Europe became genuinely no bloated terms after Donald Rumsfeld, who wanted to disaggregate the continent conceptually, distinguished between those countries that supported the United States' invasion of Iraq from those that opposed it. Uh, this was a shorthand description originally proposed by Robert Kagan in another influential essay uh, called Power and Powerlessness, in which he talked about Americans being from Mars, Europeans from Venus, and uh, uh, by which he meant that uh, Americans were Hobbesians and Europeans believed in the Kantian perpetual peace that could only be achieved through a federalized confederation of democratic republics. But he also said that the East Europeans were far more Hobbesian and therefore maybe they too, or we too, were from Mars. <clears throat> but um, Western Europe was not always happy with this view, and certainly not of the 
with the view of the Eastern Europeans, or the new Europeans, because of this new Hobbesian view. Uh, because um, we didn't always see things eye to eye. Uh, the, the Kantian view saw, saw conflicts to be resolved through long negotiations and discussions um, and the main, with the goal of maintaining stability. Old Europe saw this as a way to do things. On the other hand, for many of us, Munich, Gorta, and other city names simply don't have the same appeal as, or the same effect, or have an altogether different effect than, say, say, Lisbon. So, with the New Europe's experiences with appeasement, beginning with uh, 1938, uh, continuing through history, uh, meant that we have perforce a different bit on Shaolin. Old Europe saw stability, New Europe thought the stability was precisely the stagnation and that we needed to change things. Uh, stability, in many cases, I think in old, by, was seen in New Europe as a case of uh, Western acceptance of oppression as long as it was NIMBY, not in my backyard oppression. So that, and some today, to this day, look at New Europeans attention to violations of fundamental freedoms of speech and press and association and objections to aggression as being a case of post-Soviet traumatic stress. Uh, we see it as fundamental values that we have to stand up for. But anyway, I don't want to belabor this, but in any case, it did lead to all kinds of problems for us. Uh, as you recall, there was a president of one country currently under indictment for corruption who called East Europeans badly behaved children who did not know when to shut up. Uh, well, we did in fact support the United States in the Iraq War, but there were reasons for that which I won't go into right now. But um, I also argued at the time that the new European attitudes towards the United States have changed with time, um, and clearly uh, this has happened on the one hand the the old Europe of Sarkozy and Merkel is not the old Europe of Chirac and Schroeder. Moreover, I think that with, uh, I think we can all agree that Eastern Europe is no longer uh, blindly accepting of the United States. But this is the view of old Europe that we had, or the distinction between old and new Europe. Um, that has changed, I would say. I think what has uh, changed is, first of all, uh, a much more European attitude, as it were, a, a cooperation on the part of the new members, uh, a certain uh, loss of uh, an infatuation with the United States, as well as a fairly understandable change in the United States that sees its fundamental problems as lying in Iran and China and not really paying that much attention to this part of the world. Um, that was then, this is now. Uh, the crisis the economic crisis in the world, uh, especially in the European economy, I would argue here today, will result in a completely new definition of new and old Europe. No longer will the dichotomy apply to countries that up until 20 years ago were under communist domination. It will no longer be a description of transatlanticist attitudes or attitudes towards the United States. It is the European economy today that is currently leading to a fundamental reordering of how we see Europe, as well as what we mean when we talk about the United States as being different places, with the United States traditionally being all about freedom and free enterprise and a high Gini index and no social welfare net and European social democratic cradle to grave welfare, uh, either as the apotheosis of human development or alternative ultimate way station of a Hayekian road to hell, or to deserve it to. But in any case, those are the caricatures of Europe and the United States that we read on one hand in the Wall Street Journal or in their Spiegel, depending on which way you're looking at things. But a similar reordering, I think, is taking place in Europe as well. A partly physical, partly dead serious piece in the Washington Post in the fall of last year by Adam Applebaum maintained that the old East-West divisions of the European Union between rich Westerners with no history of communist rule versus the poor East Europeans from the old Soviet bloc 
is being replaced today by a north-south divide based on fiscal responsibility and your place in the Transparency International Corruption Index. It was a simplification, of course, but it does illustrate that Europe, too, is in flux and that the old perceptions and stereotypes are changing. In a far more systematic analysis published uh, recently, just a few months ago, titled The Last Shall Be the First by the leading scholar of post-communist and transitional economy is the Swedish economist Anders Oslund, argues that post-communist countries in the European Union have responded far more vigorously than old Europe to the challenges of the economic crisis. If you look at national indebtedness, size of the budget deficits, economic performance all among EU countries, we note that old and new or those kind of categorizations are no longer as simple as they were a decade ago. Uh, just as we East Europeans are no longer knee-jerk pro-Americans, so too are they hardly the economic basket cases that they once were with creaky infrastructure, unreformed economies, and high levels of corruption and low levels of productivity. Equally misplaced, yet slow to disappear, are comfortable but illusory old European stereotypes. A mere six years ago, the EU constitutional referendum was voted down in France through a xenophobic campaign against the Polish club, who stood parged for a total as a synecdoche for all of the great unlost chief labor of the East. In 2009, Poland was the only country to enjoy economic growth in all of the EU, probably the only democratic country to enjoy economic growth in 2009 in the world. And while Poland's GDP per capita, like Estonia's, is about 65% of the EU average, it is a growth not based on borrowing your wealth, but growth based on creating. Eurostat's latest report from uh, a week ago, 7th of January, shows that last, in the third quarter of last year, Sweden led year-on-year -year growth at 6.8%. Second place was Estonia with 5.8% growth. Poland was in third, percent, in third place with 4.7%, followed by Slovakia at 4.2% followed by Germany at 3.9. This is all real growth. It's also important to note that those are all countries that managed to uh, uh, maintain fiscal responsibility. This growth is real, it is sustainable, and with Schumpeterian creative destruction going on in Europe, throughout Europe today, I think we shall see in the coming decade, as a result of the crisis, a completely new ordering of Europe. This reordering today is most evident in fiscal policy. There is a division today, perhaps even more important than the division between East and West, between those willing to bite the bullet of following the rules we ourselves have agreed to, deficits below 3%, national debt below 60%, and those governments accustomed to borrowing their wealth that fear to take necessary steps to fulfill the obligations they themselves have written into EU law. Today, differences in fiscal policies are reflected only in growth rates, but not yet in GDP per capita. But let us keep in mind, divergent growth rates, however, over the middle and long term, will lead to a convergence between the richer and the currently still poorer, that is to say, newer members of the EU. But I would argue, and this is really where I'm going to go with my talk, is that fiscal responsibility is only part of the picture. That commonalities in a range of areas among certain countries are emerging, as is a divergence between groups of countries within Europe. These convergences and divergences will have the effect of erasing slowly but surely differences in levels of development stamped onto Europe by the Cold War and its divisions that allow only part of Europe to enjoy 50 years of growth and the other part of Europe to step. For the rest of this talk, I'd like to focus on our own Baltic Sea region, 
precisely and more precisely on what I would call the Northern Baltic Rim, comprising clockwise on the map of Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. For I'm convinced that not only that we are witnessing a shift in our mental geography of Europe, but also that the sooner we recognize that the old categories no longer apply, the sooner we can begin to take concrete new policy decisions. <coughs> but to do this, we need to forget our own narcissism of small differences. That's a term from Sigmund Freud, that we always look at the little differences, and that's what we want a big deal about. We concentrate on what, what differentiates an Estonian from a Latvian, an Estonian from a Finn, a Finn from a Swede, a Swede from a Dane, and you all know what those differences are. Let's, let's not kid ourselves, right? We can all tell a joke about the other ones, yes? <laughs> but let us focus rather on the commonalities among these countries with the implicit understanding that these commonalities distinguish this part of Europe from the other part. If we look at our commonalities, we can discern a clear northern Baltic Sea rim group characterized by, first of all, mostly small members, well, in fact, all small, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, are all small countries, no matter what one or the other might think about its own size. <laughs> Fiscal rectitude and a commitment to low deficits and national debt is another final feature. Whatever the etiology of an acceptance of the need not to live beyond one's means, is it our peasant past, our northern climate that fosters our thinking ahead and saving, it is, whatever it is, it is clear that governments in this region of Europe are willing to take tough decisions to ensure <coughs> that debt levels and deficits remain low, and are willing to take the are unwilling to take the easy road of just borrowing money in order to get re-elected. Openness to trade in the EU is another defining feature of these countries. The litmus here, the test is provided by attitudes toward one of the fundamental but still unrealized rhythms of the EU, free movement of services. While capital and goods can move easily within the EU, a strong protectionist streak remains that is most observable in attitudes towards services. You can buy a taxi or water company, a plumbing business, or an internet service provider anywhere in the EU, but God forbid that someone from another member state comes into your own country to set one up. And I think that here again, we see that virtually all of these countries are on the Baltic Rim, the Northern Baltic Rim, when it came to the discussion of the services directive, we clearly have a side of liberal trade. Another difference, or another commonality, a preference for transparency over opacity in both national and EU finances and decision making. For this region of the world, it is self-evident that we should know where our public monies go. Elsewhere, attempts to bring transparency to, for example, the common agricultural policy or other budget, large budget lines in the EU is met with stiff resistance. Related to the last two, a willingness to pursue innovation in digital solutions, not only in e-governance, transparency in e-commerce, but also in innovation. And finally, well not quite finally, what we also share is a willingness to defend liberal rights and freedoms in foreign policy. We only need to look at the responses of the Baltic Rim countries to abuses elsewhere, to electoral fraud, to violations of freedom of speech and other rights, including the arrests and beatings of peaceful protesters, not to mention armed aggression on the part of countries, that we don't, we do not remain quiet because simply because we can make a deal, do business with countries that are not democratic. This is clearly one, another area where we are different. Finally, there is a tendency toward transatlanticism and an openness toward continuing enlargement of the European Union. When it comes to the direction of the EU in the future, the countries of the northern Baltic Rim prefer to see a Europe whole, free, and integrated rather than divided, a Europe that is inclusive rather than exclusive. So I think that 
we, we should start thinking about ourselves and our commonalities in this regard, because it is very different from attitudes that we see elsewhere in Europe. And when we recognize that our differences are minor, our commonalities are great, we can begin to affect policy in, I think, a far more, uh, far more serious way. But while we have much in common, the small countries of the northern Baltic Rim are not yet fully integrated to the degree that would enable us to work out common views. Um, in two areas, institutional arrangements inhibit forging, forging a stronger, more encompassing set of positions. First, one, is, one area is security. Sweden and Finland are not in NATO, nor is there currently a strong desire to become allies. And in the case of Denmark, it opts out of ESDP, uh, so this means that we, in fact, have a hard time coming up with common positions on the northern Baltic Rim. And secondly, one other area where we don't share everything quite yet is the European common currency. Currently only two countries, Finland and as of two or three weeks ago, Estonia use the euro and hence enjoy the strong institutional arrangements that are afforded to us and as well as the additional responsibility demanded of Eurozone regions. Thus, while fiscal rectitude is, characterizes the, the countries of the Baltic Sea rim, only two are in a position to make a strong case for following the rules, at least in the Eurozone core. And it doesn't look like that's going to change for a while. The northern Baltic rim, of course, is not that unique, which is why I prefer to use the term cluster to describe our group, some kind of like Wittgenstein's cluster concept, something that we all kind of have together. There are a number of overlaps as well with other countries. The countries of the Northern Baltic Rim share with Germany and the Netherlands a commitment to fiscal rectitude, open up, openness to liberalized trade and to transparency in the EU, and to innovation is shared quite clearly by the Netherlands and by the United Kingdom. A willingness to take strong positions in defense of liberal rights and freedoms is shared by the Netherlands, the UK, and Poland. And transatlanticism is something we share with the UK, with the Netherlands, with Germany, and with Poland. And of course, an openness to continue the EU enlargement to something that's also advanced by Poland and the United Kingdom. Accustomed as we are to look for and focus on differences between us and our we might, in fact, try to look at the bigger picture. A broader view of the European Union's member states' responses and behaviors during the crisis, and indeed over the long term, even before the Great Recession, shows that the old categories by which countries were grouped, old members versus new members, transatlanticists versus middle grounders, Martians and Venusians, make less and less and less sense. Perhaps we are not yet aware of this shift in Europe. If there is any awareness of changes, then it is of larger developments the, in the world. The slow reclamation of their place in the world by a rising China and a rising India. The tectonic shifts within Europe seem minor at this point still. We might ask, after this catalog, so what? These, these, these commonalities are interesting, but what, other, what difference do they make? Well, I would argue that as these commonalities are beginning to emerge, we only have hazy contours of where Europe is going. But if we are smart enough and, in, and recognize emerging trends and proclivities, we will be in a better position to proceed. We'll know what we want. And I believe it is time now for the small and similarly the common views of these countries, in these countries, for us to get together and to coordinate our policies in the European far more closely than we have up to now. To work together to develop on those areas where we share fundamentally the same view. There is one area, and here I'll try to get more specific, where this is already happening. And uh, I'd like to draw your attention once again to something which is uh, a little noticed about in Europe. Um, we do have a mechanism to be coordinate at least some policies in the European Union. It's called the Baltic Sea Strategy of the European Union. 
Six years ago, as a member of the European Parliament, I wrote a short report for the Baltic Intergroup in that Parliament arguing that after the enlargement of 2004, the Baltic littoral had become for all intents and purposes an internal EU lake, a new modern Muslim, if you will, to use the old Roman term for the Mediterranean. This was a report present that presented to the uh, President of the Commission, I left the European Parliament, a new report for a follow-up report was written by my colleague there, Alex Stubb. Then Mr. Stubb left the Parliament to become Foreign Minister of Finland, and uh, the report then was adopted during the Swedish Presidency, uh, and has become an official part of the policy. The EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region, as it is properly called, focuses rightly on environmental issues, but those also necessarily involve non Russia, Norway. But the strategy also includes a number of other components that are maybe not that self-evident and obvious as the eutrophication of the Baltic Sea. Um, within the framework of the EU, we can work in Northern Europe to do things that the rest of Europe has not been willing to do yet. To work on policies that other countries are not just simply ready for. Uh, policies that, in which we all have a stake. Obvious areas are transport, energy infrastructure, two areas where we really do need to lot, do a lot of work. <coughs> there are fundamental issues that, uh, that will involve our competitiveness as a region in the 21st century, where we all are small countries and we have a rising China. And these include pushing for greater transparency, for having more openness in trade, to have to eliminating impediments in cross-border trade and movement, to have more IT solutions, to have more uh, transparency in the way we rule. <coughs> I think that the Baltic Sea strategy is one place we can begin to realize this, the commonalities that we share. Um, it is not a foreign policy program of the EU, it is not an internal policy of the EU, it is a macro policy which we can we accomplish all kinds of different things as a region, which will allow us to, I think, shape the rest of Europe to move in the direction that I think most of us agree is the only way to go. <coughs> so, I would ask our friends in Sweden, who have been kind enough to begin or to establish this as a policy within the European Union, but especially students and everyone interested in the European Union, to, to, work, to, to work on this, to, to find ways to develop the commonalities between us um, so that we can, in fact, um, bring the genuine integration of, the, of Europe at least into some kind of fruition in our area. Because the mechanisms are there, uh, the areas that where it is difficult to overcome with all of the EU, we can do around here to make it easy for people to move back and forth, to make good, easy for goods to move back and forth, to make our innovative economies able to, uh, to develop more rapidly. And if the rest of Europe is not interested in these kinds of solutions, well, we all are interested and we can develop them here. This even, uh, in fact, includes universities, where I think that one of the key problems that we have here is too much too much competition between two small universities, but in fact, if we begin to, uh, say, even apply the model of the coal and steel community of, of 60 years ago, then in fact, we begin to, uh, among ourselves, apportion responsibility for different areas, we can, in fact, move much more quickly and move much further ahead. So I think that there are new opportunities that are ahead of us that we can realize if we get over our preconceptions of who's who, what's what, what's old, what's new, what East and West mean, but rather focus on the genuine commonalities that we share. The old new distinctions inhibit us. The old new distinctions to this day exist in the European Union. Uh, old member states get three times the amount of cap monies as new members, even though 
for new members of markets. Uh, we, we all are in the same internal market where the price of seeds, the price of fertilizer, pesticides, farm equipment, and fuel is all the same in the internal market, but just part of it is three times as much money. Or when we look at hiring uh, for the new uh, European action, external action service, we see that for some reason, until recently, the 154 ambassador or posts in the EU, only one of them went to an East European. Um, we were told this is because the EU only hires the most qualified people, from which we can deduce that the least qualified people are from Eastern Europe, and clearly they're not so bright either. But I think that I think we will we will have to get over these these ideas. The reordering of Europe that took place. 1989, 1991, 20 years ago, by which Estonia came back as a country and is enjoying such good and close relations with Sweden today, where Sweden is the largest investor in Estonia, where Sweden is the largest export destination of, of Estonia, where the old ties, be it to, between Tartu and Uppsala, where Uppsala is the mother university of Tartu University. Tartu University, after all, is the second oldest Swedish university for whom Uppsala is uh, Mater Alma Mater, the Alma Mater's mother. Uh, I think that all of these changes in the past 20 years where we once again are getting over the old divisions are things that only only promise a brighter and brighter future. Uh, it's really up to us. It's up to all of those people who are willing to, to work on these issues. Uh, but I think that those, those people in those countries that understand that things are changing and see the new opportunities will be the ones who benefit the most. 60 years ago, 30,000 Estonians came here. They were all new European refugees. When Estonians, when Sweden measured uh, immigrant groups in the 1980s, this is where the last time Estonians were still measurable before they all became dissolved into Swedes, but Estonians who had fled were found to be the best educated immigrant group in Sweden and the most well-off immigrant group in Sweden. Per capita income is more than anyone else as an immigrant group. I think that's something to think about when we think of our potential. That when we get over our stereotypes, when we allow free trade and common interest to dominate, then in fact the northern Baltic Rim will become probably the most prosperous area in all of Europe. So that's what the thought I would like to leave you with. And I'd like to thank, once again, Uppsala University, the wisdom of, the, of Gustav Adolf to found a university in Tartu in 1632. Uh, and to thank Uppsala for everything it has done throughout the years for our university. Vivat Prescott Laureate.
otherwise it's Estonia sometimes seems to go in the wrong direction with investing in fossil fuels, energy and so on. Can you please have a comment on this? Thank you. Well, Estonia was the only so-called new member state that did not go along with the uh, other East European countries in, uh, in opposing the, uh, new, the new regulations that old Europe wanted to have. So, and fossil fuel will give us something better than that. I mean, what are we going to do? We don't have mountains, so we don't have high growth. I mean, what do we do? Uh, in fact, we all of our investment in our domestic uh, fossil fuel meet all of the requirements of the European Union, which makes it much more expensive. But unfortunately, I mean, we don't have an option. We live in a world in which there are governments that state that energy policy is a tool of foreign policy. Energy, I mean, as soon as you, as soon as you read that, as an official document, that energy is a tool of foreign policy, uh, well, then you have to, there are more important things ultimately uh, when it comes to your people and your country. You like to worry about the environment and, and not have fossil fuels, but we're talking about our independence, we're talking about a country that's gone through mass deportations and so forth. So, we do our energy first. Thank you. Another question? Uh, I'm a master's student here in Uppsala University and my question is about Europe, uh, looking at the future of the Europe. So given all the recent problems surrounding the Euro area, which are also mentioned in the speech, um, there has been a lot of speculation on the future of the currency union. What are we going to do? In your opinion, what are the realistic options? Um, what to do about it? How, how to move on? Well, I, I think we can. Uh, I think we need to get it around the rather simplistic, journalistic, uh, sort of knee-jerk uh, approach to the euro. And let us all agree that in fact the euro has no problem. The euro is in great shape. There are countries that have problems meeting the rules and regulations they themselves accepted. If you don't follow the rules, um, you get in trouble. And those, are, those countries are in trouble. But the euro is not in trouble. The eurozone is not in trouble. And countries that violate the rules are, however, are in trouble. Uh, we in Estonia, we, uh, I guess you student, as students, you probably, you know, hopefully, you have all read Thucydides' uh, Peloponnesian Wars, the Melian Dialogues dialogue where the Athenians come to the people in Melos and say, give up, and then the people in Melos say, so no, but this, that's breaking the rules. Unfortunately, it ended badly for the people of Melos, but uh, we small, that's all we have, the rules. The big can change the rules whenever they want. If you recall 2003 and the Civilian Growth Pact, the two, there were three countries that were breaking the rules. Portugal, small country, had to pay a fine. Germany and France said, oh, well, we're too big, we don't have to follow the rules, and they changed the rules for themselves. So if you're big, you can, you can change it, but when you're small, you have to follow the rules, and that's all we have as small countries. And so we insist on the rules being followed, we follow the rules, our deficit is less than 3%, our, our less, and our national indebtedness is far less than 60%. We think everyone should follow the rules, and all of us who follow the rules are going to enjoy the rule. What those countries that don't follow the rules, that have played around with the statistics, I mean, that's going to be a problem in the future. And it'll be our problem that we'll probably lend money to them to help them, but we insist on the rules, and I'm convinced the Eurozone will be very strong. Uh, I just don't know who's going to be in it. My name is Peter Wallenstein, I'm a professor of peace and conflict research here at the university and thank you for your very learned uh, lecture. Uh, it's not so common that presidents talk about uh, Kant and Hobbes and so on, 
So in case uh, things don't work out for you in August, maybe we can uh, get you something here instead. <laughs> my mother always said, have a backup. <laughs> uh, but my question is, uh, uh, if we go back about 20 years, uh, there was a lot of discussion what will happen to the Baltic states. Uh, and some of the notions were to create a security community of some sort around the Baltic Sea. Uh, you did not say much about security at all. It doesn't mean that Estonia feels very secure, that we actually have a secure community, or are there anything that worries you about security in, in the situation where Estonia is? Well, we have NATO. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, maybe some other countries around the Baltic uh, have security problems, but Article 5, we have full confidence in Article 5, especially after uh, the NATO summit where there was a recommitment to Article 5. Uh, I was actually was just curious because I looked at, uh, I read, I reread a memo just a few weeks ago. I wrote an obituary or commemoration of uh, Richard Holbrook, uh, uh, the late Richard Holbrook, who uh, I frequently talked to when, he, uh, when I was ambassador in Washington. He was uh, the Assistant Secretary of State for Europe. And I went to see him in June of 1995 uh, and when uh, there had been a number of alarming signals. Uh, at the time, uh, there had been a piece in the uh, or a think piece uh, in the Financial Times by the head of the Ebenhaus Institute saying uh, only those countries that can join NATO that join the EU and vice versa, uh, where with the logical conclusion the Baltic countries cannot join. And uh, there are a number of other statements like that. The CDEU spokesman for foreign policy said that, well, we don't want to do Yalta, but we have to take into account the legitimate uh, security needs of Russia when it comes to the Baltic Sea. Um, and then there was a suggestion made uh, in uh, Gotland, in Visby, at a, a meeting of, uh, of uh, people from, uh, from Germany uh, talking to Swedes and Finns, saying that the Swedes and Finns should take over the security responsibility for the Baltic countries. Uh, I went to talk about that to uh, Holbrook, and he said uh, the United States will not allow uh, will not subcontract the security of the Baltic states out of the hands of in Stockholm. Hmm. Um, so I think when it comes, I think that, uh, you know, if we want to improve the security in the Baltic Sea region, there's a lot we can do. I think the most obvious steps for that need to be taken, not by Estonia, but I think they need to be taken in Stockholm and Finland, not, uh, Stockholm and Helsinki. Not that we would do anything about it, would certainly be glad to see the uh, to see the Baltic Sea, uh, which is already a modern Ostrom in the European Union, become a modern Ostrom in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Okay. Mr. President, uh, my name is Matthew Storm. I'm a student of uh, political science here in Uppsala. I would like to ask you about the situation of the Russian minority in uh, Estonia. Be big more specific about that. More specifically, uh, their situation in uh, Estonia, in the new, uh, in the new modern Estonia, in the Baltic Rim, in the European Union, and their uh, effects uh, on uh, relationship with uh, Russia. Well, I would say they have a fairly diverse. Uh, first of all, not a minority in most cases, because uh, the minority we have a Swedish minority people that lived in uh, Estonia for a thousand years and then fled. Uh, those are basically immigrants from the Soviet occupation period, mainly. Uh, so it's not a minority, let's get that straight. Uh, secondly, there is a minority, a Russian minority of those people who have lived in, in Estonia, I mean, traditionally. A smaller community, in fact, than the Swedish community that we have. Uh, of the people who are Russian, I mean, it's hard to say with Russia. We have people who are very pro-Estonian, generally younger people. We have people who are very pro-Putin. 
We get more votes for if we have a higher percentage of support among those people who vote in Russian elections for Putin and for Lukashenko than we do than they do in their own countries, uh, 87, 90 percent. So, but that's a small portion. So we, it's very difficult. This is why when I say please be specific, because it's kind of saying what's the position? What is the situation of the Estonians? You know, like, you know it's a normal Gaussian distribution of people. There are people on good time, people don't like the country. There are attempts occasionally to instrumentalize the, the minority by, or is that the, the not Estonian living Estonia for foreign policy purposes by countries whose capitals are not Tallinn. Um, but, you know, those attempts at instrumentalization have not really worked. Um, uh, in general, most people who live in Estonia are very happy to live in a country with freedom of speech and with freedom of press, freedom of association, uh, free of movement of labor, capital. You can work anywhere in the EU, you can travel anywhere in the EU. These are all things that make people appreciate living in Estonia as a member of the European Union. I believe we have time for one final question before the President wants to leave to our So please. Mr. President, thank you for a very interesting speech. Uh, could you say something about this uh, uh, gas pipe being put down into the uh, uh, Baltic Sea. What's your position on that and, and what was the risk in the future and so on? Well, we didn't have much to say about it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it was, uh, it was agreed uh, to by uh, by, t uh, by a president and a prime minister who, bo who didn't bother talking to us about it when they agreed to it. And of course, uh, let's put this way, I think one of the big problems we face in Europe today is that, um, that uh, we didn't have during the Cold War. It would be incomprehensible for a, for a prime minister to go work for the Soviet government after he uh, left office. But in this uh, post-Cold War period, it doesn't really matter. You can go work for anybody. And the same country that you, you make a deal with another country, and then you go work for that country afterwards. In the European Union, that's no longer allowed. I mean, if a commissioner does that, uh, uh, he's fine. In the United States, if you, uh, if you go work for a, if you're a defense employee, and you, you're working on a procurement committee, and then you go work for the company that won the bid, you go to jail. Uh, in the European Union, if you're a European Union member state chancellor, you go and get a uh, multi-million dollar salary. How's that for a position? 